Good morning and welcome to the 11th meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee. I ask everyone present to please switch off their electronic devices or switch them to silent so that they do not affect the work of the committee this morning. Apologies have been received from Alex Neal, Liam Kerr and Monica Lennon. And I welcome to the committee this morning Liz Smith as Liam Kerr's substitute and James Kelly as Monica Lennon's substitute. Can I now invite Liz and James to declare any interests you consider to be relevant to the committee's work? Liz. Thank you, Convener. Uh, may I declare that I'm a member of the General Teaching Council for Scotland and I'm also uh, a member of uh, two governing boards of independent schools, George Watson's College and St Mary's Prep School in Melrose. Thank you. James. Uh, thank you, Convener. I have no relevant interest to declare. Thank you. Item 1, the committee is invited to agree to take items 4 and 5 in private as noted on the agenda. Do members agree? Thank you. Item number 2, the next item is an evidence session on the Auditor General for Scotland report entitled Audit of Higher Education in Scottish Universities. And I welcome to the meeting Paul Johnson, Director General for Learning and Justice, and Stephen White, Strategic Policy Lead, both from the Scottish Government. Dr John Kemp, Interim Chief Executive of the Scottish Funding Council, and Alistair Sim, Director of University Scotland. I thank you all for attending this morning after we rescheduled the meeting from our original date. I invite Paul Johnson to make a brief opening statement, followed by Dr Kemp, and finally Alistair Sim, before I open up to questions from members. Paul Johnson. Thank you, Convener. The higher education sector makes a pivotal contribution to the Scottish Government's vision for Scotland's education system, one that's characterised by equity and excellence. Higher education is also an essential catalyst in growing Scotland's economic strength. As the Auditor General recognised in her report, it plays an important role in relation to all four of the priorities set out in the government's economic strategy, including investment, innovation, inclusive growth and internationalisation. I provided two written submissions to the committee in respect of the Audit Scotland report, and there are just a small number of key points that I would wish to reinforce. The Audit Scotland report rightly states that the Scottish higher education sector is successful and internationally renowned. This success is based on a partnership approach with universities, the Funding Council and the Scottish Government working together to deliver and sustain the success. The Scottish Government's substantial financial investment each year more than £1 billion each year for five years now is an essential element in delivering the success. And this investment provides a stable base for our universities to attract a range of additional funding. It also means that we're able to deliver on our collective ambitions to widen access to university education, with 14% of Scottish domiciled full-time first degree entrants to Scottish universities now coming from the 20% most deprived areas of Scotland in 2014-15, and that's up from just around 11% uh, in 2006-07. This has been delivered while maintaining the Scottish Government's commitment to ensure that access to higher education continues to be based on the ability to learn rather than the ability to pay, meaning that now more than 126,000 undergraduate students benefit from free tuition each year. The Scottish Government recognises that there are challenges that need to be addressed. Audit Scotland have highlighted a number of these, and I'm keen to see work progress in light of their recommendations. Our continued engagement with the university sector, including through the recently established Strategic Funding Group, will allow these challenges to be faced together, albeit in a context of the overall funding constraints faced by the Scottish Government. I look forward to um, answering further questions on these matters from the committee. Thank you uh, very much. Um, I now have Dr John Kemp. Okay. 
Thank you for this opportunity to discuss the Auditor General's report. The report describes a successful university sector in Scotland. Five of Scotland's universities are in the top 200 worldwide, according to the 2017 Times Higher Education World University Rankings, which is more per head of population than almost any other country. A good part of this is down to the hard work and success of students, staff, managers and leaders in Scottish universities. Performance in learning and teaching shows a generally positive picture. In the past years, the sector has delivered beyond its funded places target. The number of full-time Scottish undergraduate students has been increasing over the past decade and in 2014-15 was at an all-time high. But there are challenges. Um, although the proportion of Scottish domiciled undergraduate entrants to universities from the 20% most deprived areas has risen over the past five years from 12.8% to 14.1%, we recognise that we need to make further progress on this issue. That challenge is greater for school leavers, where the proportion um, and from SIMD20 is considerably less than 14.1%. In the area of research, Scotland's performance is very good, demonstrated by the results of the most recent research excellence framework. In that, the Scottish sector increased the proportion of Scottish research graded at the highest level that matched or exceeded the performance of other UK nations. Recently, we published a review by Professor Graham Reid on progress with the Innovation Centre programme, and it showed that they are making good progress and that there are ways which the programme could be enhanced in the future. The Funding Council um, will continue to work with the university sector and with the, with the government to address all of the report's recommendations, and I'm very happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Dr Kemp. Alistair Sim. Thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, give evidence and make an, uh, an opening statement. Um, the Auditor General's report celebrates Scotland's universities as successful and internationally renowned, and the Auditor General recognises universities' contribution of over £7 billion to the Scottish economy each year and our central contribution to Scotland's economic strategy. The Auditor General also identified, in her words, significant underlying risks in universities' finances in 2014-15 and major challenges ahead. She pointed to real terms erosion of teaching funding by 6% between 2010-11 and 2014-15 and a real terms cut of 69% in capital funding over the same period, and that public funding was not covering the costs of research. She expressed her concern that overall, universities were not able to generate surpluses that meant that they were operating today without damaging the ability to do so tomorrow. Looking beyond 2014-15, she highlighted significant challenges from increasing costs, potential further reductions in Scottish Government funding, and risks to universities' ability to continue to increase their income from other sources, particularly fee-paying students from the rest of UK and non-EU countries. <coughs> These risks are now crystallising. SFC revenue funding of universities has been cut by 6% in real terms since 2014-15. That adds up to a 12% cut in real terms over the period of the Auditor General's report from 2010-11 to 2016-17. Over that period, average funding per student has declined by 8% in real terms. We estimate that public funding now covers only 90% of the cost of teaching home students. Within a limited resource for SFC funding of research, increased research excellence across the sector has driven the perverse outcome that several of our world-leading world research-intensive universities have faced multi-million pound cash terms reductions in SFC research funding. Increased pensions costs and national insurance costs, UK government charges for international staff and the apprenticeship levy all increase the cost base and we fear further restrictions on the recruitment of international students. In the last set of available accounts, five out of 18 institutions were in deficit and other stakeholders' written submissions to the committee draw attention to the consequences that this, that this is having for jobs. It's essential to students, staff and the wider economy that Scotland has a diversity of truly excellent universities. We do not currently have a sustainable financial basis for that. University leaders have welcomed the Deputy First Minister's specific commitment that the Scottish Government will ensure that throughout the period of the 2017-20 to 20 spending review, the allocation for higher education from the Scottish Government's budget will support the excellence, competitiveness and accessibility of our world-class universities. 
we look forward with confidence to the realisation of that promise. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now move to members' questions. Liz Smith. Thank you, Convener. Um, just as a matter of clarification, uh, perhaps uh, Mr White or Mr Johnson could ask the, answer this question. Um, we were obviously expecting the announcement of a widening access commissioner. Could you give us a quick update as to where uh, that is? I'm happy to address that. Yes, um, we, uh, the government accepted all of the reports, uh, all of the recommendations in the Commission for Widening Access, one of which was the uh, recommendation around the appointment of commissioner the timetable set out by the uh, in the report was the end of the year, um, and it remains the case that uh, ministers um, plan to make an announcement on this matter shortly. I appreciate I'm not in a position to uh, make that announcement today. It is one for ministers to make, and I hope that they will be making that shortly. Okay, thank you for that update. Um, I think we're all agreed, obviously, that the success of the university system in Scotland is absolutely outstanding, uh, for all the reasons that have been set out, uh, not just in uh, the Education Committee, but in various reports that have uh, given it a glowing reference, and that's very good news. However, uh, in the very comprehensive, very good report that Audit Scotland produced in the summer, uh, as Mr Sim has rightly identified, there are very serious concerns about funding for the future in order to allow us to maintain that excellence, and particularly when it comes to uh, research and to the quality of teaching. Um, I wonder if I could just ask, uh, in, in terms of the, the three things that I think are extremely important, is whether we need to have a, a review of higher education funding, uh, given what Mr Sim uh, has said this morning. Um, in, in, in the classic case of whether, if we, if we don't have sufficient money to be able to deliver what we have been delivering, then surely that suggests that there is a need for this uh, strategy to have to change. So I'd be interested in your comments on that. But also, specifically, that has to be set against the background of the changing demand for international students and EU students, and also against the uh, widening access agenda. So could I ask you very directly, do you believe that the Scottish Government should undertake a review of higher education funding? Again, shall I pick that up in the, in the first instance? Um, the issues around higher education funding are very live issues which we continue to work on uh, with both the Funding Council and with University Scotland as part of the strategic finance group that has been established in recent months. So that is a context where the key uh, partners, including a number of university principals and uh, University Scotland representatives, are looking at the data um, and are having constructive discussions about the requirements that will exist in future in relation to university funding. And in that context, what the Auditor General has set out is, is helpful. And I, I, would, I think it is important to recognise that uh, what Audit Scotland have set out is, is, is a sector that has been successful in generating um, additional revenue um, on top of what government has uh, put in, and indeed a sector that has uh, made an overall surplus of 140 46 million in 1415, notwithstanding some of the uh, risks that uh, Mr. Sim has identified, which I don't uh, dispute at all. But I, but I absolutely recognise the need for us to be working constructively and collaboratively on issues around future funding. That's exactly what the strategic finance group um, is doing um, at present. There are just a couple of other aspects of work that are underway, which may uh, be which may be worth mentioning, and it may be you wish us to expand on it um, in, in, in due course. We have now begun a review of the learner journey, which was uh, set out as something which would be undertaken in the <coughs> education delivery plan. That is looking at the whole, uh, the, the whole issue of the, the pathway from school to college to university to work, and that gets into issues around, or will get into issues around uh, demand and supply. Um, and we are, of course, also now undertaking the review of student support, which I recognise is, uh, is a related issue. So there's, uh, we're giving very, very active consideration to these issues. Mr. Kemp. Um, yeah, as, as Paul has said, I mean, the, the issues of you know, 
how we fund universities, um, the volume of what we, we fund the, and the way we fund it is something we, we constantly review every year. Um, as part of spending reviews and uh, you know, in the funding council as part of um, our, our annual budget decisions. Now, we do that with the government and increasingly with the University of Scotland as well um, by, you know, by essentially starting well, um, looking at every option um, for, for what is available for, for changes to funding. So I, I think to that extent, we do um, review um, HE funding every year. Um, do you mean a more fundamental review than that? Yes, I do, Mr. Yes, Kemp, yeah. Dr. Kemp. Rather, I think it's very important that there is, you know, one of the great successes of the Scottish system has been, yeah. uh, over centuries, not just uh, many yeah. decades, has been its ability to have that long-term strategic yeah. oversight of what it's uh, trying yeah. to do. Yeah. Now, the, the pressures on it are now intense uh, financially, as uh, Mr. Yeah. Sim has outlined, yeah. but they're also. Um, pressurised by specific aspects of Scottish Government policy, widening access being one of them. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's also, also pressurised by external factors because of the Brexit vote. And, yeah. and these are very considerable pressures, as have been identified yeah. with Audit Scotland. Yeah. And what, what I'm asking for is whether you believe that there, there has to be a major review of what higher education funding should be for a long term. Um, on, on widening access, um, that it, the extent to which that will cause a financial pressure is, is debatable. Um, there, you know, there are a number of ways that access could be widened to Scottish universities by making better use of the capacity in the system um, through improving the learner journey and so on. You're, you're quite right that on, mm -hmm. on Brexit, um, you know, there are a series of issues about research funding that could you know, be detrimental, but there, you know, there are other sides um, to that on, on teaching funding, which to some extent might balance it. But th those are the kind of issues that we do consider um, each year as we're looking um, at spending review decisions. Now, some of those, um, particularly on Brexit, are, remain unknowns to some extent. We can begin to see the shape of what might be coming down the track, but we don't know exactly what they are yet. Um, and as we do, um, I'm fairly confident we will be working with government and University of Scotland on you know, looking at how we deal with those issues. So to that extent, I think we are already reviewing those, those areas and, and, and will continue to do so as they become clearer. Um, so I, 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 I'll leave it to colleagues whether they think a, a more major review would be, be useful, but I think these are things we're looking at. All right, to pick you up on one specific point, uh, Dr Kemp, when you mentioned about widening access, which is a very specific uh, policy agenda that 20% uh, of those from disadvantaged backgrounds, uh, sorry, 20% of the intake of universities um, by 2030 will come from that, that background. Now, that's a very specific um, political choice that the Scottish Government has made. On top of that, there are issues about providing more places in the university sector. Uh, specifically, if you're not going to, you know, squeeze out other students, do you believe that the widening access agenda can be delivered without the constraints that will be on other students in the system if you're not going to provide extra places? The, the number of young people in Scotland, or your school leaving age, um, has been declining for the last few years and will continue to decline for another few years. Um, increasingly, the the entrance to universities are not going direct from school. Some are going to college first and then coming in um, through that route. And that doesn't always mean that you then need to do four years at university. And increasingly, it shouldn't mean doing four years at university. Um, and there are a number of other things that you know, would affect the calculation of whether um, you know, expand, widening access can only be done by expanding the system. I think it can be done through... Um, taking account of demography um, and also by reforming the learner journey and making best use of the places we have. So I don't think it necessarily means additional funding um, for universities. Dr Sim, does that tie in with uh, what you have just told us, that there's a major crisis of financial resources? Uh, well, I won't claim a doctorate yet. <laughs> but um, Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, I've given some indications in my opening statement about the, the, the stress that the system's under. And I mean, to come back to, to, to your question, does this mean you need to review how it's funded? Well, I think that's, that's a political choice, how you fund universities. And obviously, you know, we recognise there's a broad parliamentary consensus um, in favour of um, free full-time 
um, undergraduate uh, education. Um, and you know, it's, it's the same is true in many continental countries. But if you're going to do that well, it does come at a price. Um, and we are seeing the indicators of, of stress at the moment. I mean, I, I, I don't really, for instance, agree that um, <clears throat> the situation on admissions is, is as, as John describes it, all right, there is a de demographic dip, but actually what we've seen is application rates from qualified learners have accelerated faster than the demographic dip. Um, if you look at the percentage of school leavers in 2010 who got the equivalent of four hires, it was about 30%. In 2014-15, it's, it's up to 35%, so the number of qualified learners is increasing. Um, if you look at the success rate of school leavers in getting into um, university, um, back in 2009, 81.4% of those who applied would get into university. Um, it's dropped now to 73.7%. Um, so you're seeing stress in a system that isn't actually at the moment, even though it has expanded gently in terms of student numbers, is not expanded at the rate that um, demand from qualified learners with the ability to learn has expanded. Could I just tease out that point? Because it's very important. Uh, there are more Scots domiciled students going to university, but there are also a growing number of Scots very well qualified who are finding it much harder to get into Scottish universities because the, the number of students that are applying for places, just as you've rightly said, is increasingly competitive. Are you worried that the Scottish system will lose some of our very best pupils because they can't get into Scottish universities and will therefore have to look elsewhere? I think that, that's 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 part of the issue. I mean, you know, I think um, what possibly worries me more fundamentally is um, that there are students, you know, from all sorts of backgrounds who, who who have the ability to come to university and succeed, who are finding it more difficult in Scotland than they are in other parts of the kingdom to get into university, and um, just because we've, we've got a capped system here. I mean, the Auditor General um, quoted that um, over the period from, I think it's 2010 to 2015, demand had grown by 23% um, from Scottish students, whereas the um, number of offers made by Scottish universities had only grown by, by 9%. So, you know, they're, they're, they're <coughs> we do want to offer opportunity to as many people who, for whom it's, it's the right option. Um, and unlike in England, we're, we're operating in a capped system where we're limited our, in our capacity to do that. Thank you. Colin Beattie. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm looking at uh, UCU's submission, and I was intrigued by the proposal for a business education tax. How did you see that working? Is that being direct? Is, is that that's one direct to Scottish government? I have to say that is uh, that is not something which um, I have. Uh, which I, which I can update the committee on at this stage. Uh, clearly, that would be a matter of uh, policy for uh, ministers and ultimately for the parliament to consider. Do you, UCU have any idea how this would work? Well, UCU is not represented oh, here true. today, so I'm not sure My we can speak for... My apologies, I have nobody I, to interrogate. Them. I don't think we can speak for them. Let, let me then cut to the... Uh, what was discussed just a few minutes ago about Scottish domicile students and places. Um, the Scottish, according to the figures we've seen here, the number of Scottish domicile full-time first degree university entrants increased by 11% between 2006-07 and 2014-15. And yet uh, we've got comments here that there's issues in relation to uh, providing places for them. But we're seeing an increase... I think the central point I'm trying to make is, is that, we're, yes, we are seeing a, a, an increase um, over time in um, Scottish domicile students going to university, which is, which is something that, that we celebrate greatly, um, but it's not, not an increase, it's keeping up with an increase in demand. And just moving to Unison's submission, um, they comment here that the SFC is reluctant to hold universities to account for their performance. Is that true? You would probably get different answers on that, depending on whether you spoke to universities or, or, or some others. We, we do hold universities to account for their performance on a, a whole number of things. I think the, the, that particular comment is, uh, probably reflects a view that I, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm putting 
my own gloss on this is that we should be harder sometimes on the out, you know, um, making sure that outcome agreement targets are met. Um, and there's also we think there's always a, a balance to be struck by agreeing um, outcome agreement targets with institutions um, and then having targets that they own um, and see as aspirational um, can sometimes be um, it, it hard to do if you're then going to be um, very brutal in, 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 you know, in fining people for not meeting them. So we always try to strike a balance between working with the institutions to get mutually agreed targets um, for improvement and then being quite proportionate in you know, the consequences um, of um, you know, those targets <coughs> not being met. So we would, we would tend, you know, were a, a university not meeting its targets and so on, to you know, look at ways that could be improved or, or move provision about um, rather than you know, do anything more drastic. You know, where it's underperformance and the number of students, we do claw back and so on. So I think it's very much a, a question of interpretation about what the correct level um, of, of intervention by the funding council is on that kind of issue. Well, given the fact that we give universities over a billion pounds of public funds yeah. and the fact that SFC have clearly a, a regulatory role in this, how do you exercise that? We exercise the... Um, the, the linking of the, you know, the the billion pounds worth of public funding um, with uh, you know, the aims behind that funding through outcome agreements with institutions and lar largely through outcome agreements, which um, you know will are, are documents in which we will agree with the institution what the priorities are for that funding and what the, the what the targets and success measures are for how we will know whether they've done that and we do that. Um, you know, very much linked to um, you know the national aspirations um, of the government and the funding council and and of the universities, um, and use that as the prime method by which we link the government funding um, and what universities do. And by and large, that works well. The, the successful system we've talked about and the auditor general's report talks about, you know, I think reflects that that system um, is broadly working. Now we constantly review it. There there are. Um, you know, priorities change, our experience of how well it's working varies from year to year and we constantly keep it under review but by and large that is our, our main method of linking the two things. And if there's an issue, what penalties do you have in your armoury to bring universities to heel? We, we have um, largely funding um, on, on, on issues um, where we have asked you know, we've agreed with the university that it will do x and it's not doing it for example there were some the, the additional places for widening access a few years ago they were part of the outcome agreement process um some universities got some additional places to recruit more students from md40 where they were not doing that we took the places away and moved them to universities that could and you know th so that's the kind of sanction we would use if we are funding a university to do something and it's not doing it then we reconsider that funding. Just, just moving. Is it on the same point? Are you moving to another? I was point? moving to a slightly different. Can I ask? Liz Smith wants to come in on this point, if that's okay. Yes, may I just come in on this point? In uh, on, on page uh, 49, four, uh, 50 of the um, Audit Scotland report, it, the comment is made that universities are increasingly relying on income from non-EU students as part of the financial planning, but growing competition, obviously, from the rest of the UK and other countries makes that increasingly challenging. So notwithstanding what you've just said, Dr Kemp, that there is the implication that the uh, level of funding that has to come in from uh, these sources is significant. And as we all aware, um, when the new principal of St Andrews was installed this week, she made some pretty blunt comments about the implications uh, for one of our... Uh, ancient universities as to what that m might mean. Do you accept that the pressure to raise that additional money is really significant? Oh yes, yes. I mean, we we, we recognise in the, the case of St Andrews, um, our funding is you know, less than twenty percent of of their total funding, and that a good chunk of what that institution and many others do, um, you know, relies on. You know, on bits of the environment that are beyond our outcome agreement and, and, and that which we can control. And we would encourage universities to be outward facing and to be pulling in um, you know, funding and students and researchers from elsewhere as well. Uh, are you concerned, though, that that might change the nature and the structure of universities in Scotland? I mean, Sally Mapstone went as far as to say that, you know, there was the possibility of a, a sort of private identity to the university. Is that something that would concern you? I, I have to say I didn't read her comments. I mean, 
I, the, the, she clearly made a, a statement that um, you know, the, the amount of funding that came from SFC um, to St Andrews was relatively small. Um, and uh, actually she did say, but she accepted the accountability that went with that. Um, but she was thinking more long term about your know, positioning of St Andrews, what they do to maintain the other 80 percent of funding, which we would applaud them in doing. Um, I, I didn't read it as in, in any way, um, you know, her, her saying that our funding was in any way causing a problem for the other part. Yeah, about greater diversity. Is that something, Mr. Sim, that you'd be concerned about if universities under the umbrella of University Scotland started to diversify? Well, what, what, what I understood her really to be addressing was the, the, the genuine stresses that the university is under. I mean, I think she, you know, as a university which hasn't even hired a normal proportion of EU staff, she was hideously worried about the prospects of um, recruitment of talent from the EU. Um, uh, she was worried about the um, possibility of further restrictions on recruitment of international students, who are just so important economically and culturally, and uh, as, as you said, are, are part, uh, you know, essentially of having a financially sustainable system, if we can, in Scotland. Um, and also, given that, um, as, as we've said, public funding is, is not covering the costs of publicly funded activities in teaching and research, um, then obviously, you know, anyone would look at how, how, how do you do your best? How do you make a university both excellent and accessible? How do you maintain its international competitiveness? I mean, every, every university leader has to look at that. Now, I think our aspiration um, and what we're trying to achieve in the discussions with the Scottish Government is that um, public funding um, can maintain um, an excellent internationally competitive and widely accessible university sector. Um, and certainly when we look towards the Scottish budget, um, we would be looking for an outcome that shows that we are starting on a trajectory back towards uh, the recovery of sustainable funding levels that enable us to do what we want to do for, for students and to, um, to promote excellent research. Thank you. Um, just moving to a slightly different thing, but what we've touched on earlier on, it's in connection with the impact of the limits on funded places for Scottish students and EU students. How does that affect university entry requirements? Uh, well, we're going to be blunt. Obviously, if you have more pressure on places, um, then um, in a sense, um, as a rationing system, you, you may have to put your... your thresholds up. Now what you need to do um, around that, uh, which I think is, is hugely important, is also make sure that you're applying that with contextual admissions. That's really important that actually when you're looking at people coming from disadvantaged backgrounds, you're not just looking at their exam grades, you're looking at the circumstances in which those exam grades were attained. For instance, are they coming from a school with low progression to higher education? Are they coming from a, a free school meals, meals background? Are they coming from um, a neighbourhood of multiple deprivation? You need to look at a range of these factors and actually say, is that a student you know, who may not have, uh, let's say, two A's and two B's at higher, but actually we think they've had to work hard to get their three B's and we really need to give them a bit of extra consideration. So within that um, capped system, um, I think immense amounts of effort go in to, uh, to making sure that it's, it's, it's operated fairly. Um, if I can look at um, statistics on admissions, one of the things I find interesting across the system um, is about 14.5% is of applicants come from, our applications come from the most 20% deprived postcodes by SAMD as to 14.5% of acceptances. So, you know, if, if you're coming from a deprived background and you apply to university, you've got as good a chance of your application being accepted um, as if you come from a more privileged background. How does it affect student choices in terms of the courses that they might opt for? Um, well, I mean, I think, you know, if we can express that very briefly, in, in, in a capped system where um, entrance thresholds are, are relatively high, you, you, you may have to pitch yourself at what, what you can get into rather than what you might ideally aspire to. But um, I think we do have a, a wide and rich range of options available. <coughs> and also, I think one of the things we do have in Scotland is a four-year degree structure where actually you have the opportunity to find your way through different disciplines, through different specialisms, over a course of five years, so your 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 professional and personal future is not kind of cast along tram lines in the sense that it might be in an English three-year degree. How does F SFC funding take into account this capped system? It, 
well, we, we have a particular number. There's two elements to the cap. There, is, there are the number of funded places that we um, offer to universities. And then above that, there is uh, universities can recruit above that number um, and uh, take the students with only the SAS fee, but no funding from us. So that's called a... a the most the specific courses or no no we we we, di we direct well I'll come we do to some extent um, direct funding to specific courses um, in some subjects called controlled subjects like medicine teacher education nursing and so on um, for most places however and you know we agree the numbers for those with uh, um, the, the relevant part of the government for most um, subjects we we have a a number of places that goes to the, the, the institution rather than the subject. Um, and as part of our outcome agreement, there will be um, you know, incentives within that to do more STEM and so on for, to meet um, you know, needs of specific um, um, you know, industries and so on. Um, but we don't specifically allocate a number of places for chemistry, biology and history in a particular um, university. Um, it's up to the university to, you know, to take those decisions. Um, but as I was saying, th th there is a number of places above what we fund that um, universities can recruit to, but there's a cap above that to, to essentially to control the, um, the cost of the SAS budget because those places are paid for just by the SAS fee. James Kelly. Okay, thank you, convener. Uh, Mr. Sim has, has painted quite a, a graphic picture of the financial challenging financial landscape uh, which universities face and as, as part of that in your opening statement you indicated that out of the 18 institutions five were running at a deficit uh, and that was there for presenting a challenging situation in in terms of jobs you can just maybe expand on that a wee bit more um, well i think you know to put it bluntly um for publicly funded activities, we're, we're, we're being funded at below cost. Um, we reckon about 90% of the cost of publicly funded teaching is coming from um, the funding council. Um, overall, the other general says around 85% of the cost of research is covered by the, by the blend of funding council and competitively won, for instance, research council funding that we get. And that, that, that's, that's putting a system under real stress. Um, and, um, you know, I think obviously university leaders um, want to retain talent as, as much as they, they conceivably can. But when, when you have got a system under stress, when you do actually have to try and balance the books so that you're going to have a, a university that is excellent in five years' time as well as excellent today, um, then sometimes you have to take extraordinarily difficult decisions um, that you may have to reduce your commitment to certain areas of your um, academic effort. You may have to um, have voluntary runcy programs, you may in some cases have to move towards compulsory runcy. None of these th things are anything that anyone wants to do. But ultimately, if you haven't got enough money to run an excellent university, um, you have to reduce your activity levels. Um, and I think you know, one of the things that, that concerns me particularly is, is the impact of that on the local economy. I mean, typically, um, university jobs are relatively highly paid jobs in the local economy. Um, and um, I think um, the typical um, salary, well, salary plus on costs of a university employment is is about forty eight thousand pounds a year. That's that's that compares really well, um, you know. For instance, with um, employment in tourism, there's a lot of casualised labour, and where you're talking sometimes only ten thousand pounds a year. Um, and so, when you lose these jobs, um, you really are losing quite big economic impacts in the local economy, um, you know, in an, in an environment where I think if you look at regional economies, if you look, for instance, at the Tay side, I think, you know, you see getting on towards 20% um, of the local economy is in some sense dependent on having a world-class um, higher education sector um, at the heart of a, a cluster of economic activity. W would it be, a, a, can I ask a, Mr. Sum a follow-up question first and then we'll come back? Um, would it be fair to say that at the current funding levels, it's going to be difficult to st sustain the existing staffing levels? It is. I mean, that, you know, that, you know that, that's what we've seen. I mean, over the past year, um, you know, we've seen publicised examples, for instance, at UWS, at, um, at Dundee, at Robert Gordon, at Aberdeen, you know, where, where there's, there has been publicity about 
the really difficult and contentious decisions that have to be made um, in situations of, of financial constraint. Now, you know, my hope, my, my, my genuine hope, is that actually um, we're now heading towards a trajectory um, back towards sustainable funding levels, and that's certainly the, the, the you know, the... The, the, the goodwill that we're bringing um, to the discussions that we're having with Scottish Government. Um, and if we are, then, you know, great. We, we, we can sustain our economic contribution. Um, we can continue to be at the heart of, of um, clusters of economic growth um, and, and, and grow employment and grow student opportunity. Um, I really, really hope that's going to be the case. Thank you. Mr Johnson. Thank you. I have already accepted and uh, I would... Um, reiterate that the government recognises there are real pressures on the uh, university system. Um, equally, I think this committee would expect uh, that from a government point of view and from a funding council point of view, we are uh, very demanding around the need for public money to be securing the best possible value and impact. Um, and that's where uh, I think it's important that there's ongoing collective work done around how we can secure greater efficiencies from uh, the overall public investment. And indeed, I think the Auditor General makes some comments around that, recognising that efficiencies have been secured to date, but that work must continue to make sure we get <coughs> the best possible uh, value from the very substantial public investment that is being made. Everybody would agree uh, about value for money, but is the government concerned that the, the warnings that Mr Sim has given in terms of not just the potential reduction in jobs, but the loss of expertise in the sector? Well, what we have to do is look at all of the data that exists around the funding situation of universities and also look at the financial context of many other institutions that are reliant on public funding as we make overall spending decisions. So this committee uh, looked at the college sector, uh, I think just a fortnight ago, and we engaged with some of the financial issues uh, there. When we look at the higher education sector, the Audit Scotland report tells us that the sector's overall income increased around 38% in real terms between 2005-06 and 14-15. 60% real terms increase in income from research grants and contracts around the same period. Overall sector spending increasing by about 35% in the same period and an overall surplus of 146 million in 14-15. Now that's not to say there are not uh, real constraints that we need to look at carefully, but it is to say we need to look at the overall picture um, and make decisions about the funding in future um, in light of the demands that exist um, with the higher education sector, but also the demands that exist in the part of other institutions that are reliant on public you, funding. You've quoted a lot of statistics, but my specific point was about the loss of expertise. Are you concerned about that? Well, we, absol we are absolutely committed to ensuring that Scotland's universities continue to thrive, uh, to punch uh, above their weight in, in relative terms, and uh, that, uh, that does require continued expertise in the, uh, in the university system. That's what we want to work with both the Funding Council and uh, the university system on. Uh, it's something that's a subject of, of ongoing active deliberation, and that will continue. Thank you. Can I maybe just touch on an issue in terms of access as well? Um, I, I was surprised to, to look at the table in um, page, page 92 of the report in terms of offer rates to uh, you know, Scottish students. Sorry, it's 42. Exhibit 14. <laughs> offer rates for uh, Scottish applicants. Uh, and I was surprised to see the, the wide variation and also the fact that there are a significant number, seven out of the 17, where the offer rates were less than 50%. Uh, in terms of Scottish applicants. Uh, I know there's already been some discussion around this, but you know, just say to take an example of Glasgow Cal Caledonian University, you know, that's running at 46%. Why, why would that be? Um, I think there's a, a I mean, basically a, a lot of students will, will put in, you know, multiple applications to universities. So if, you know, for instance, a, 
a student who thinks they're going to get good grades or has got good, really good grades, um, you know, might be really ambitious and say, I want to do a really demanding and highly selective course at Edinburgh, but I'm going to also um, select other universities where um, I've got courses that I'm interested in doing and might be slightly less demanding. So what, what you tend to find is that there's a bit of sort of bunching up of applications um, towards the most highly selective institutions um, and obviously only a subset of the people who apply to the most highly selective institutions um, are going to get an offer. Um, so, um, you know, there might be an institution that, 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 you know, also is very high quality, but it's got slightly uh, lower um, requirements for your hires or advanced hires that, 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 that accepts you and, and you end up going there. So it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a measure of selectivity. And, you know, for instance, take Glasgow School of Art, you know, right up there at the top. Um, it's, uh, and I'm just wondering, I can't see the conservatoire there, but it'd be in a very similar um, position, you know, to, to, to get into an institution like that, to, um, to make your way in, in, in art or, or in the performing arts, um, you really have to be absolutely at the top of your, um, your potent, you know, you have to have really top level potential um, if they're going to recognise you as someone that they can take on and really help build a professional, successful career with. Can I just ask Mr Johnson, from a Scottish Government perspective, do you think it's a, a desirable um, policy outcome where out of the 17 listed, um, 11 of them are running at 55% or of, of, of less in terms of successful offers to Scottish applicants? I don't think it's possible to be prescriptive about what the acceptance rate should be, partly because, as Mr Sim has identified, a number of students are making multiple offers. Uh, nonetheless, I do accept what the Auditor General goes on to say at paragraph 102 of her report, where she points to the need for uh, us to have a, a clearer picture overall as to what is happening in terms of trends, in terms of both applications and offer rates. That's something that we accept the need to work on further with the Funding Council and with University Scotland. Mr Johnson, you said that you're confident that Scottish universities will continue to punch above their weight, but Mr Sims said that research has been funded at 85% and teaching has been funded at 90%. How, how, does that, how does that work? Well, I think there's scope to look in more detail at the particular uh, data that Mr Sim has put forward. It's based on a track system. Um, that is compiled by the universities themselves, and it does take into account a wide number of measures, um, <clears> including <throat> a measure around the university seeking to secure some funding or some resources for future uh, investment and improvement in the, in the estate. When you look across Scotland and the rest of the UK, um, what you see is a situation where, as I understand, uh, research uh, actually um, is funded at a lower overall percentage rate in England than it is in Scotland. So I think it's helpful to look at the, the I absolutely accept in terms of teaching, um, the figures that we're seeing at the moment suggest that the figure is, is significantly under 100%. Um, as I say, when you... I'm too concerned about what's happening in England. I'm concerned about what's happening in Scotland. Yeah. And it seems to be that, you know, I know, for example, that at Dundee University, uh, when research grants come in, there is not sufficient mon money from the Scottish Funding Council to actually sustain those grants and sustain the, the facilities that are required. So how do you expect... Scottish universities to continue to punch above their weight in this way if you are underfunding them? Well, I, w what I would point to is the fact that universities have been and continue to be <coughs> successful in supplementing the public money that they receive with money from a wide range of other sources. And that has been absolutely key um, to the success that Mr Sim has pointed to and to that broader economic impact that they have made. Um, do we need to look carefully at this data? Absolutely, we do. And that's something which, um, which, which is being considered as part of our strategic funding discussions. My point in <coughs> referring to England was simply to say that this is a UK-wide measurement, the track measurement. Um, and we do need to look at the measures right across the UK. And in some measures, we see that Scotland compares as well or, in, or indeed more favourably. That was, that was my purpose in trying to you, make the comparison. You just said there that um, you're looking at universities' other sources of income. And we had a discussion that Liz Smith prompted earlier about St Andrews University obviously receive a lot of money from other sources. Um, it's my understanding, though, maybe Dr Kemp can clarify, that 
um, the SFC does not consider uh, other sources of funding when they are considering how to fund uh, courses at uh, the universities. Is that correct, Dr Kemp? Um, up, up to a point, we look at the, the, the financial health of the, the whole institution to some, yes, but I mean, when we're funding um, something at a university, we are funding that thing. We're not looking at, you know, making an assumption that they will automatically pull. Now, on research, it's a bit more complex because a lot of... Um, can, I, can I, sorry, just take that clarification there. So, Mr Johnson, are you saying that you're looking at a different system of funding? Because you keep referring, you've referred all morning to other sources of income from universities and taken that into consideration. But Dr Kemp has just clarified that that is not a consideration for the Scottish Funding Council. So where are you going with this? I think, I think it's essential to look at the overall picture. So yes, the Scottish Funding Council um, injects very significant amounts of resources into the university, but I, I do think that the Audit Scotland report looks at the overall <coughs> picture. And uh, I think it would be um, it would be making a, a false distinction to, to look only at one source of income. We need to look at the, the whole picture, and when we do so, we see the the overall success that the um, institutions are managing to secure. And I'd, I'd, we, to be clear on, on research funding, quite a lot of the external income that universities will pull in on research will not cover the full economic costs. I mean, a lot of the the research funders explicitly don't cover that and that's part of the, the dual support system when there is an interaction between our system um, and the, you know, the, the, the charity funding and so on which won't cover the real cost so you would expect some um, you know, cross subsidy there. Liz Smith. Are you not making the case then uh, given that uh, Audit Scotland quite rightly has pointed to the fact that you need to see this in the broadest picture yeah. I mean the, the, the success of Scottish universities depends not only on what the government funding yeah. is, but on external sources of finance oh, too. Yeah. You've yeah. got to see that in the round. Yeah. My point would be, back to what we discussed earlier, that th there is a need, given all the pressures on the system, to review higher education funding as a direct result of what you've just said. Yeah. Um, but let's be clear, we, we do appreciate that there is other so there are so other sources of funding um, for yeah, for universities, and that will affect how how efficient our funding is and what it can be used for. Um, my point was that you know when we're funding something, then you know we ought to expect to pay most of the cost of that, and it, you know, it needs to be something that washes its face in its own right, or it would be contributing to to problems at the university. I'm not sure that that necessarily leads to you know a you know a, a wider review of funding we needed, rather than something that, as I said, can be dealt with through the um, the annual discussions we have about the correct level of funding. Because let, let's be clear, Alistair is making the point to us constantly about the the, the, the difference in track T levels in between Scotland and England and so on. We are aware of those things and can take account of them Dr. up Kim, to a point when we have the money as part of our annual um, funding decisions. But, but Audit Scotland and Mr Sim are making a very clear case indeed that unless we do something radical, we are not going to have sufficient money in the higher education sector in Scotland, whether it comes from the government or other sources, unless we have a, a, a system that allows us to put more money into that sector. That's the point. Um, the, yes, I mean, Mm. Up, up, well, up to a point. Um, the, the, uh, there are other ways in which um, some of the aims that we want from the university sector have been done other than, no, than more money. However, we need to constantly make best use of the money we have available in the system um, in order to achieve the ends we want from the system. And we need to do that efficiently and effectively and in a way that is financially viable for the institutions. That you, the role of the funding council yeah. is to do that with the government's share. Yeah. The accountability yeah. Yeah, lies with the funding council yeah. and the Scottish government for that particular part of university funding. Yeah. The broader point, which Audit Scotland is very, very clear about in this yeah. report, and as is uh, University Scotland, is that that's only part of the way that Scottish universities are funded. Perhaps quite a large part, yeah. but it is only part... Yeah. And the challenges, given Brexit and given the widening access agenda, given all the other pressures yeah. of changing demand with students, yeah. is that we need to see it in the round. And that 
the Scottish Government aspect, which is obviously the responsibility of the Funding Council, mm -hmm. needs to work in tandem with Indeed. universities who are bringing in sources from, from elsewhere yep. to ensure that, that that bigger picture is addressed in the future challenges. I hope that the Scottish Funding Council would accept that that collaborative approach is absolutely crucial. I completely agree with that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, We've heard a lot over this last week about the proposals uh, to merge Scottish Funding Council, Scottish Enterprise, uh, Highlands and Islands Enterprise. Alistair Sim, is that a good idea? Um, I think there, 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 there's, there's, there are things that we certainly welcomed from the Phase 1 report. I think particularly... Um, you know, if if we can get a better alignment between the activities of, of public sector bodies for um, promoting um, innovation and productivity, you know that's good. If there's some sort of board that can help them to to work better together, that's fine. If we can create new, no wrong door approaches, to make it easier for business to navigate their way through um, the landscape of support, that that's good. I think I took that from the first report. Um, we've also said, I think, very clearly in, in evidence to the Education and Skills Committee, look, there's a lot of issues that really need extremely careful thought um, in phase two. Um, I mean, to, to, to give you some examples, I mean, the, the, the role of the Funding Council um, in supporting universities and the role of universities is much wider than, than enterprise and skills. I mean, fundamentally, on the, the, the learning side, it's about education. And out of that, you, you grow people who can, you know, drive innovation and enterprise because they're, 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 they're adaptable, entrepreneurial, employable graduates. Similarly, on research, you know, the fundamental is getting your fundamental of high quality research um, in universities. That's the trunk from which the applied research is stuff that more easily um, translates into um, business growth, um, ultimately, uh, branches. Um, but you need to have that fundament of, of being able to how, do excellent fundamental research. So I think um, as, as we look forwards, it's really important that, you know, if this goes forward, that, that their structures are built that enable, um, that don't put too much on this proposed super board because a limited number of people sitting around the table are not going to have the competence to deal with the huge remit that, um, that they've been given unless there are proper substructures underneath that um, where people can really take an expert view and where there can be a role like that of the Funding Council where you can take an expert view that challenges government, that says, actually, government, if you want to achieve your results, you've got to be doing this, and also is able to challenge universities. I think that, that intermediary role of being able to challenge both ways um, is actually incredibly important. It's also incredibly important that we, as universities, you know, are um, a force of initiative um, and that we're not drawn into ministerial direction, and we've had good assurances on that point, um, and, for, and our risk of being reclassified as public bodies by the Office for National Statistics isn't heightened by being drawn into a less arm's length relationship with, uh, with government, because uh, as we've said in our evidence to the Education Skills Committee, that actually would be catastrophic. Okay, so you've had reassurances that it won't be chaired by a minister. Um, I don't think those reassurances were heard in Parliament. I think the, 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 we, 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 the reassurance we've heard is simply the reassurance that you've heard in Parliament that um, autonomy and academic independence will be respected. Okay. I, I, I may be wrong about this, but my understanding of what was said in Parliament was that there, there was no assurance that it wouldn't be chaired by a minister. So are you confident that uh, ONS reclassification is not a risk here? Um, well, we don't know what the structure is going to be, so I can't really give you an answer to that. Right, OK. Um, I mean, your answer to my first question, you seem to be saying, if, if I'm correct, sorry, it's quite a long answer, you're kind of saying it'll depend how it works, it'll depend how all these institutions work together, it'll depend on the structure, but your members must have uh, a, a very open-minded approach to take to this proposal. We'll just see how it works. And it, Are all your members... Of that view, I don't think it's it's. Let's see how it works. I think it's um, you know let's use the opportunity that's been presented by phase two of a review to get in there and co-design um, in a way that actually makes sense for um, the broad the the breadth of what universities do and contribute to um, the economy and society, which is much wider than, than enterprise and skills, and that maintains um, our ability to be at arm's length from ministers. Um, and for there to be a body that has a challenging role both to universities and 
to government. So it's, it's not wait and see, it's get in there and, and see if we can make this work. And, and I don't know the answer to that yet. We, okay. we have to get the work done. Okay. And I mean, I think myself and certainly a colleague's understanding is that we didn't receive assurances in Parliament that it was going to be chaired by a minister. So if it were to be chaired by a minister, which still seems to be an open possibility, what view would University of Scotland then take? I think there's a real risk there. I mean, I think, um, you know, if, if particularly if you look at um, ONS classification, um, the more you come into... Um, the sphere of influence and direction from government, the, the heightened risk you have of classification, which means you can't earn entrepreneurial income, um, you can't hold reserves, and basically... It would which be, Mr Johnson seems to be relying on. Yeah, um, and so, uh, so, so I think what we're seeing very clearly in, in, in our discussions, and this needs to be carried through in phase two, is actually, look, let's proceed with care. Whatever the design is, it needs to maintain that firewall um, that means that universities are at arm's length from government um, and that we're not heightening that risk of reclassification, um, nor are we um, diminishing universities' capacity to be a voice in society that, um, you know, in many ways is aligned with government. We're always trying to achieve, uh, you know, we're, we're partners in achieving inclusive economic growth, but, but we're not government. Mr Johnson, did you hear a reassurance in Parliament that there would be no ministerial chair? Um, that's something which I, I I don't want to speak for ministers on this. I'm not sure of everything that's been said in Parliament on the matter. I do. I, I apologise. I can't absolutely confirm that. What I can say, though, is that I recognise what Mr Sim has set out around the further detailed work that will be done on the Enterprise and Skills Review in the course of stage two of that review. The issue around how the overarching statutory board functions, including how it is chaired, is something that has to be uh, looked at um, in detail. And uh, Mr. Sim made reference to, I think, you know, a, a sense of co-producing the outcomes of that recommendation. Um, University of Scotland is represented on the ministerial review group that is overseeing the work of phase two of the review. Uh, that group has met in recent days and will continue to meet as the work is taken forward. Mr Johnson, do you think there's a risk of ONS reclassification? Well, I am I'm aware that the, the issues around ONS reclassification are matters that need to be looked at carefully, and uh, certainly we would want to ensure that the new arrangements which we put in place do not lead to any uh, reclassification. So it's absolutely one of the factors that needs to be taken into account as we look at what the mechanisms going forward will be. So the Scottish Government uh, is, is against ONS reclassification of universities, I assume? Well, ab we absolutely recognise the risks that that, would, that 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 would create. I think that's something that I know that Parliament has looked at and discussed in the past. And uh, the current status of universities does indeed uh, support the attraction of a, a wide range of additional uh, funding. So, uh, yes, we would want to look at that issue carefully and ensure that there is not uh, reclassification of the the universities. So you wouldn't want to do anything to risk it? I would not want to see reclassification. Okay. Dr Kemp, do you have a view on SFC merger? Um, well, let's be clear, it's not the SFC merger, it's the merger of the boards um, or the, the creation of a, an overarching board. Um, we're, we're looking forward to engaging constructively in phase two um, and, you know, we think it's important that as part of that there is a recognition that while enterprise and skills is very important to what we do um, and is you know a subset of the um, the output of our colleges and universities um, as Alistair has said um, you know education and research um, are arguably quite a bit wider than, than enterprise and skills and we think it's important that a governance structure um, emerges from phase two which recognizes that so we, we're looking forward to engaging um, you know with the government and others in phase two um, uh, to make these points. Mr Sim, what is the what is University of Scotland view to turn to widening access on the system that's currently used, SIMD? Do you think it's efficient? Do you think it's working? It's not enough on its own. Um, I mean, I think, um, what does SIMD do? Well, it tells you you live in a postcode area where there's a lot of indicators of multiple deprivation. Um, and obviously, you know, growing up in an area of multiple deprivation is, is, is one factor of disadvantage, even though within that postcode area, um, you can cross the street and, you know, go from the the area that's really deprived to the area that frankly isn't really deprived. 
Um, our view is, as you you know, we, we are absolutely committed to to promoting wide access to universities. We've got an action plan for that. Um, but we need to be looking at it on a properly evidence basis where you would look at a multiplicity of factors of, of how you indicate whether somebody is from a, a really challenged background. Do they have free school meals? What do you know about their household income? Um, do they come from a school with low progression to higher education? Because bluntly, um, only about half the people who get free school meals um, are in uh, an SIMD20 area. Half of them are, are in you know, other circumstances of deprivation, and SIMD20 does absolutely nothing to, to measure rural deprivation. So it's, it's an inadequate measure, and I think you know, the conversation we've had for some time with government and the funding council is actually we need to be measuring who individually um, can demonstrate that they really deserve um, the special treatment that, that we should give, um, recognising their circumstances of disadvantage, rather than looking at it on a, on a post-code basis. So you're in favour of a more sophisticated system of indicators? Yes. So Mr Johnson, why is Nicola Sturgeon's target for widening access based on SIMD alone? Well, what the government has done is accept all of the recommendations in the report of the Commission on Widening Access. Chapter 4 of that report has got a very detailed discussion of the different measures that can be used and uh, the Commission concluded that SIMD is a valid marker of deprivation based on a wide range of data and there's, I, I could say a lot more about the I think the very helpful discussion of SIMD alongside other proposed markers. Um, the government has accepted the recommendation um, that I think uh, Mr Sim has alluded to which is that there is scope for further work to be done on getting the very best possible um, markers, um, recognising that all of the markers have got some limitations. But nonetheless, I would come back to the fact that the Commission's conclusion was that, um, as matters stand, SIMD is a valid marker and the one that is best used at present. OK, but if you've been having discussions with University of Scotland for years, Mr Sim said, about a more sophisticated system, why has Nicola Sturgeon set her target just on SIMD? Surely that's not very progressive. Well, well, as I say, what, we've, what, what uh, the government has done is accept in full the recommendations of the Commission. And the Commission's recommendations are expressed in terms of SIMD. So it's about accepting these recommendations. Um, but alongside the... Um, uh, or, sorry, rather, one of those recommendations is that work continues um, around, the, uh, around, I suppose, getting better precision in terms of, of the markers. Okay, so you're saying you're, yes, I'll bring you in a second, Dr. So you're saying you're open to a more sophisticated system that Alistair Sim's talking about? Yes, because that's, again, that's part and parcel with accepting the recommendations. Okay, Dr. Kemp. Can I say, on the, the, the national target, that is one of the things that SIMD is very good at. SIMD is a very good overall um, way of, of looking at which areas are more deprived, looking at the characteristics of people in, in, in actually quite small data zones and, and working out the overall success of a system. So for a national target, we think SIMD is, is probably um, as good as we could get. And that's, that's why the Commission, I think, came to that conclusion. Alistair is quite right, though. When you come to decisions on individuals, um, SIMD is, is perhaps less good in, in that the data zones covered by SIMD, you know, they, they cover about a thousand people. Not all of these people will share the same characteristics. If a university is making a decision on to whether to admit that person or that person, you couldn't tell exactly who to admit from SIMD. You have, you'd have to look at more personal characteristics. But if you're looking at the overall performance of a system, SIMD is a good, robust and stable way of looking um, at performance over time. And it's one of the things that we shouldn't lose sight of. There are some things it doesn't do well. It's not good at the individual level always, and it doesn't work as well in rural areas. But it is a very robust and stable way of looking at the performance over time in meeting needs of particular parts of the population. OK. Thank you. Gail Ross. Thank you, Convener. I'd like to draw the committee's attention to my register of interest, where it states that I'm a board member of North Highland College, which is part of the UHI. Um, I'm actually glad that you were talking about SIM not being as good in rural areas, because obviously, being from Highland, we've found that quite a lot. Um, again, touching on Brexit, which we tend to do 
um, quite a lot and it was mentioned earlier that we really don't know what a lot of the implications are and we accept that. Um, but what we do know is that, um, well, Alistair Sim mentioned that the, the cash terms for research and development is going down. A lot of the research and development money that we have comes from the EU. 30% uh, of the UH, UHI's external funding comes from the EU. Um, and they're quite worried, especially places like the um, Enviro Research Institute up at North Highland College have already seen postgraduate places being pulled and there are uh, very worrying implications of Brexit. I know you've already said that we can't guess, but do you have an educated guess? Uh, well, when I said we, we can't guess, I mean, I, I, I wasn't implying we just sit, wait back and see what happens. As, as, as Brexit happens, we need to be working um, you know, with the government and others to understand the impact of each part of it um, and the impact on things like re or some of the regional funding that's been helping UHI where that's going to come from in future um, and, in, and in terms of research funding, how possibly ways could be arranged so that um, Scottish universities can continue to access that because not all of the, um, the, the, the countries that access at the moment are part of the European Union. So there are a series of decisions to be made that as we work through this and understand the implications and timings, then with government we would need to work out how, how we mitigate some of these and put them possibly remove some of them. Um, so, yeah, wh while I said um, some of them were unknowns at the moment, we, we are striving to make them knowns as soon as possible and then work with others to find solutions because we are very much aware that this is, is something that affects a whole range of universities in different ways and with different European funds and UHI, you know, has particular issues. Brexit is just one of those huge things um, that, that we're having to wrestle with in an extremely uncertain environment. I mean, it affects us in, in multiple ways. We've already uh, you know, re reflected on the need to attract staff from across the European Union and also the, the extremely difficult situation that principals have found themselves in when European Union staff already here have been saying, look, what happens to me? What happens to my family? What happens to my access to public services? Um, and the best we can say, and you know, we said it's kind of a Scottish government is yes, we, we value you, you, you we, your contribution here is crucial. But when you get beyond that, you can't give answers, and that's a really unsatisfactory position to be in as an employer. Um, I think you know we're we're also um, European research funding has been important. It's about you know, 95 million pounds a year of research funding comes from Europe to to, to Scottish universities. Um, we would like to be able to continue to participate in these networks, as indeed do some other countries, Norway um, and indeed Israel. Um, not just because of the money, you could you could you could organise money in different ways, but but you know, also fundamentally because it just keeps that ecosystem of cross-border collaboration going in a way that that keeps universities excellent. Um, structural funding, as you said, I mean particularly for for UHI. You know, if there's no European structural funding, that puts quite a, cha quite a challenge back, I think, on, on government to, to find alternative ways of, of supporting that. Um, and also, as we look to students, um, you know, I think we, we, we do have to find a model um, where we can remain open to um, a reasonable cohort of European students in the future. They, they, they bring something rich to, to our campuses. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, we have to think about how that can be done. So, uh, it, you know, in, in, in an environment of the uncertainties that, that I, I outlined in my um, opening statement, it's just le it adds another layer of uncertainty. I just add, I think uh, Mr. Sim sets out the issues very clearly, um, and it's another area where um, the government must work hand in hand with University Scotland and the Funding Council, and indeed is working closely with University Scotland and the Funding Council to ensure that we do all we can to um, protect the current um, diversity, both in terms of uh, workforce, students and funding arrangements that we see in the higher education sector. Um, I would uh, perhaps just add that uh, the committee will be aware of the government having established the Standing Council on Europe. Um, 
Anton Muscatelli, the principal of Glasgow University, uh, has recently chaired a session that's specifically um, working on these issues around what can be done to ensure the best possible uh, protection for um, the university sector going forward. Okay, thank you. So, um, Mr. Sim, would University of Scotland then echo the call from the Scottish Parliament, well, the majority of the Scottish Parliament, uh, to the UK government to reassure the families and uh, EU workers that we have that they are going to be welcome to stay here? Absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, it's um, you know, six, sixteen percent of our, our workforce. It's it's people who are really, really important in our university communities, and it is just painful not being able to say to them. You know, not just that you're welcome, but that we can give you assurances about what your future is going to be. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to touch on another aspect of funding that um, was in the report, and that's city deals. Um, they're springing up all over the place. Um, but certainly being involved with the, the, the Highland, um, well, we call it city and region deal, but really it's just an Inverness city deal. Um, a lot of the, the criteria for using that money is quite specific. Um, do you have any details of how current city deals are being used um, by universities and uh, what they're being used for? Um, we, we, we don't have a collated list of, of all of the, the university involvements, but we, we're aware through discussion through our outcome agreement managers on some of the city deals that, that currently exist that um, the, the Aberdeen one, for example, is, is doing quite a lot of work on innovation, um, which of, which the universities, um, Robert Gordons and Aberdeen, are very heavily involved in. Some of the Edinburgh ones at an earlier stage, there's quite a lot of discussion in there about skills aspects um, of the and, and innovation in that area. Um, Alistair may have more on some of some of the other ones, but the, the, some of it are at an earlier stage. And well, you'll know the the Inverness one in, includes aspects that UHI is heavily involved in as well. So the, there's a variety of different models. They, they they seem quite different, which are perhaps appropriate because they are individual city deals rather than a, you know, a, a single national program. My sense is that by and large, universities have been fairly big players in in putting together these deals and, and as both as contributing their existing funding um, and making use of the additional funding. Um, we, do, we don't, um, we, we've been aware of them, as I say, through our outcome agreement managers, but we, we haven't been a, an official partner to any of them. Okay. I, mean, just, I think just echoing what John says, I mean, I think, you know, wherever it's a city deal, there'll be um, universities closely engaged in that. And, you know, I think in Edinburgh with the bi-quarter, I think it's a big, a big theme there in, in trying to really... Um, further catalyze Edinburgh's extraordinary identity as a hub of biotechnology growth. Um, I mean, just um, if I could just offer a slight correction to something earlier, um, because it's relevant to this question. Um, um, the uh, total employment attributable to higher education institutions in, in the Dundee City region is 12.5%. Um, I think I said something slightly higher earlier, but I think that's still relevant, because when you look at that, when you look at um, a similar figure of about 7% for, for the Edinburgh region um, and a similar figure for the Aberdeen region, um, you know, what you see is, of course, we've got to be involved in the city deals because actually um, just by sheer economic impact and just, just, just by, you know, being at the centre of these clusters of companies that come here because they feed off the, the student talent, the graduate talent and the, the discovery of universities, um, you know, we're fundamental to, to regional growth. Um, and so you'd expect that to be reflected as being at the heart of city deals. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to go on to talk a bit about student loans. In 2013, mortgage-style student loans that were taken out between 1990 and 1998 were sold to a private company. Um, and that company has had less than positive reviews in a lot of cases. Do you think that enough was done to explain to people that the system was changing? And did they realise that if they had more than one loan, i.e. one with the private company and one with SAS, that they may be paying them off concurrently instead of consecutively? 
to pick that up and say that I think uh, the point that's been raised is not something, as I recall, that's covered specifically in the report. So is it something that I could offer to follow up on in, in more detail and provide a response from government? I'd be absolutely happy to do so. But as I say, I don't have an answer in front of me to that point. That I do apologise. Thank you. Um, and just to go, uh, we've, we've spoken about um, widening access and um, attracting students from deprived areas, and, and quite, quite rightly, we have a target for that. Um, but it does say in the paper this time, you'll be glad to know, that grants have gone down and loans have gone up. On page 48, um, it also said that there is no up-to-date national data on how much accommodation or living expenses are going to be. Now, particularly coming from the Highlands, even though with the creation of UHI, that has kept a lot of students in the Highlands, and, and ultimately that is our goal. But you're still going to have students that won't be able to access certain courses, have to go to a city university. Maybe they make the choice to go to a city university, and that's also, you know, great. It would be useful for us as elected members, but I think it would also be useful for students and their families that are making that decision to have that kind of broader statistic. And do you feel that students from deprived areas are adequately funded to move away um, should they want to? important points uh, which were indeed referred to um, by the by the Auditor General so I see that at page 48 of the report and um, these are significant issues and uh, the whole issue of student support is, is is such a significant issue that the government has set up its overarching review of the student support system which I'm sure the committee is aware of uh, that is now up and running that's chaired by Jane Ann Gaddia the chief executive of Virgin Money and um, it's bringing in a lot of other uh, partners um, to look at the whole system and as part of their work I expect that group to be picking up on the matters that have been raised by the Auditor General in relation to student support and uh, therefore feed, uh, feed these um, issues into the advice that they will provide to uh, ministers in due course. That's, that's uh, in the course of next year. Next year, okay, thank you. Charles Thompson. Thank you very much, convener. <clears throat> I just wanted to first of all touch on the very first question that my colleague Liz Smith asked around about the widening access commissioner and appreciate that more details to, to come from ministers. But my particular question is, will this new commissioner be able to challenge the government? Um, at Education and Skills Committee, there was submissions in relation to Education Scotland and increasing politicisation of Education Scotland. So I'd like to know what safeguards you will be putting in place to ensure that the new commissioner is protected against political interference um, and that when they feel that things are not working on the ground, they can actually challenge the government on it. Back to the recommendation one of the Commission on Widening Access, which is the recommendation that government has accepted. That sets out what the role of the, the, the Fair Access Commissioner should be, and it includes holding to account those with a role to play in achieving equal access. Now, there are many players in the system that have, you know, that fall within that description, having a role to play. That clearly includes the universities, but it absolutely includes government as well. So we would expect that the uh, commissioner is holding to account the entire system um, on the basis that progress is needed right across the board. OK, thank you. Um, following on um, from the question, both from Liz Smith and, and Jenny uh, Mara, in relation to the widening access um, agenda and how... The, uh, it will be based on SIMD in postcodes. Um, I know from visiting Abertee University, and again within the papers, you could see that they had a 77% offer rate. Um, they're very, very proud of being able to offer those in the most disadvantaged communities those opportunities. Um, is there not a risk by basing it on the hit and miss um, assumption of postcode? Um, that where you do have areas where, although it's SIMD, you actually take in affluent areas. For example, the principal of Aberty himself lives in an SIMD area. Is this not a boost to middle class students living in those areas rather than deprived students? Yeah. And in that way, is there not a risk of actually displacing the most able students? Yeah. I think back in some ways, if I may say, to our need to consider very carefully the totality of the recommendations of the Commissioner. Mm -hmm. It's uh, uh, Sorry, of the Commission on Widening Access. It's not about just one of them. So it, it, it seems to me that the Commission gave very careful consideration to the, the
the, the best possible measure, accepting there isn't a perfect one, but the best possible measure to be used given the data that we have, and that's what's been accepted. Equally, what has been accepted is the need to do further work on refining the, the data um, that we have available, and that's what we will do. And, and I would repeat my earlier point about what SIMD is very good for is, is measuring progress over time, particularly at a system level, but also at an institution level. What it is less good at is making individual decisions about whether to admit that student or that student. Um, so if, if, if universities are, are making the right decisions about um, you know, contextualised admissions and working with schools in the most deprived areas to increase aspiration and attainment and so on, then that will affect SIMD without them making admission decisions based on SIMD because it will it, it will overlap with the right um, actions. So I, I, would, I would stress again, it's, it's, a, it's a measure, it's not the only way that you would select a student. I think the fundamental problem that exposes is that you know we may make the right choices at university level of taking in the people who present the the the, the, the signs of coming from a, a challenged and disadvantaged background, but if but if we're not taking them in from predominantly from SMD twenty years, we might be doing a brilliant job in widening access, and it won't it won't uh, register on on that metric. Yeah, absolutely, um, and making the right decisions that would. Um, <laughs> Actually, following on um, just from the, those answers in relation to the further work that will be going on to refine um, the data, and actually I think as the convener managed to, to, to um, point out in, in her own questioning is that this has been a discussion that's clearly been going on for some time. Is there a timetable? Um, when will we see the results of the further discussions? When will we see a finer, refined model? And when do you think that would be presented to committee or parliament? Well, the, the, the refining of data that, we, uh, that we're doing with um, University of Scotland will be doing, you know, from from now and, and to some extent have been doing over the last year or two is largely about additional um, types of information particularly at individual level so you're not looking at where somebody lives or where they went to school um, but you're looking at you know their parental income and other attributes that apply to the individual um, and those would be for individual targets in institutions and for things that they could use in contextualized admissions so that work is ongoing at the moment there is also a timetable set out in the report. So recommendation 31 says that the Scottish Government and Funding Council should develop a consistent and robust set of measures to identify access students by 2018. Thank you. Um, we learned today, um, I think it's in the, the Herald, that the widening access policy um, is anticipated to cost more than £13 million in its first full year alone, and also annually um, once we get to 2030. How accurate is that report, and also how sustainable do you think it is? I have in front of me are that the government has funded additional widening access and articulation places over the last four years to a total of £128 million. So there has been very significant public investment um, associated with the progress that we've seen in widening access. Um, I've seen the article uh, to which you refer, um, but I haven't been able to uh, fully interrogate the, the figures that are there, and I would wish to do so with colleagues in the Funding Council before being able to really comment on their, on their accuracy. Uh, Dr Kemp may have more to say on it already, though. Yeah. I, I, the assumption behind the, the, the figures in the Herald article are, are simply adding more of the same, and just taking what we currently do and adding more. And as I said earlier, I think there are ways of you know, looking at the learner journey and, and, you know, and considering demography and so on, which might give you a different answer. So I, 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 referring back to my, my earlier answer, this is a really complex area where there's several um, things that you need to you know, factor into. The total number of young people coming out of schools, the, particular, the number of older people who want to go to university, um, the overall participation rate you want, um, the kind of learner journey that people have, whether they are repeating level seven of the SEQF more than one time and so on. So there's a number of these things that need to be factored in. The, the Herald um, figures look reasonable if you, if you factor in doing one way, but there are other ways of doing it too. Um, with, obviously, with the consent of um, the convener, once Mr Johnson's had the time to do that forensic analysis of the, of the figures, would you be able to um, write to the committee to advise us? Yes, we certainly provide further information to the committee on that matter. Um, 
in relation to, and again, it's been um, touched on by all my colleagues, the overall funding for, for universities, and uh, we've seen that reduce and, and anticipated continue re to reduce through 2016-17. Uh, the report itself advises a 6% reduction in real terms. Further research funding is projected to reduce in real terms by 7%. And I think Mr Simmons will highlight it in his opening statement, as well as a question from the convener, um, that we're seeing Scottish students, home students, underfunded by 10%. So is it not the case that the inability to sustainably fund our universities is leading to a slow erosion of our institutions, and because it is a slow erosion, the government feels it can ignore it? Well, I do not... Well, I, I would begin by emphasising our commitment to working with uh, both the Funding Council and the university sector to secure the continued success of our world-class institutions. So we have a sector of which I think we are all enormously proud. And what we need to do and what we are doing within the overall financial context is to work closely, uh, imaginatively, uh, you know, fully to try and secure the continued success of the sector. Now, this committee is well aware of the overall restrictions that exist in relation to public finances. The Auditor General, um, I think in giving evidence to you before, has recognised the, the tough uh, or the, the difficult government, the difficult choices that need to be made by government in relation to the allocation of resource. But what we want to do is ensure that future funding decisions do secure the continued success and sustainability of uh, this particular successful sector. Um. Mr. Sim, do you have any comments on that? Um, well, that's certainly an aspiration that, that we share. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, to, to credit the Scottish Government, we are in constructive discussions with them. I mean, what do we want to see out of that? I mean, I think we do want to see um, a, a 2015, uh, sorry, a, a, on the 15th of December, um, a budget um, for 2017 18 that, that marks the start of a trajectory towards recovery of sustainable funding for teaching. Um, that at least protects, in, in real terms, research funding um, that uh, continues the extremely welcome injection of capital funding that um, the Scottish Government made in September of this year, because as, as the Auditor General said previously, it had collapsed by 69% in real terms, and so starting to see recovery in that was um, extremely welcome and will be very economically um, catalytic. Um, so, you know, uh, I, I'm optimistic that the, the, the quality of discussion we're having is securing recognition of the need to achieve that. Um, and um, we certainly bring in creative ideas to the table about how it can be achieved. It's not just saying, um, you know, let's, let, let's see the, the colour of your money. It's, we're also bringing ideas to the table, for instance, about how one can fund postgraduate taught students in a way that makes master's level study more accessible to Scottish students and also more financially sustainable for um, the Funding Council. We're also talking about whether there's ways the apprenticeship levy can be used to catalyse new ways of working between employers and universities. So we're, we're in a creative discussion, but we need to see um, a trajectory towards the recovery of financial sustainability. And uh, one last question, convener to, to uh, Mr. Johnson and uh, Mr. Sim, um, is uh, touching on obviously my colleague Gail Ross very articulately you know, raised questions on the challenges posed by um, Brexit, um, and those obviously you know, can't be underestimated. There are challenges; uh, the most significant challenges from it do come to our, our higher education institutions. And appreciate what you've said, Ron, about the importance of the protections that need to be put in place. To quote the principal of Edinburgh University, he said that the post-Brexit landscape will offer us many opportunities to thrive, and we'll be ready to take them. So as well as ensuring those important protections, what work are you doing in relation to uh, the negotiation process, relation to access to single market, etc., uh, to develop a plan for a post-Brexit landscape? Are you looking at the potential and also opportunities as well? Yes, we do need to look at all of the possible outcomes and ensure that in relation to a wide range of scenarios, we are ready to support the sector. And uh, that's something which I think this committee and indeed the Parliament rightly expect to be kept informed yeah. of. Yeah. Um, I mean, we, we've um, discussed objectives with, with Scottish Government um, broadly, as I've summarised earlier in this hearing. Um, also, we have an influence on UK Government. Yeah, I don't know how great that is, but through, through Scotland Office, through our relationship with Universities UK. Um, I mean, the opportunities, you know, obviously, I think that the irony we find ourselves in is if... if, if Brexit is encouraging um, businesses, institutions, 
universities to look beyond Europe for opportunities, you know, okay, we can understand that, but then we're finding ourselves crashing up against the potential further restriction of our ability to attract international students and even international staff from from abroad. And we just find ourselves in this irony where we're being told to get out there and exploit international opportunities, and then we're being threatened with even further restriction on our ability to compete internationally. Thank you. Mr Johnson, you said you don't want ONS reclassification, so your government must have risk assessed this before the proposals emerged. How, in your risk assessment, how might it impact the ac widening access agenda and outcome agreements? Because presumably there'll be rules in place about how far you can push universities. Well, in terms of the enterprise and skills review, I think the, 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 the key point that I would um, that I would emphasise is that that work is still ongoing, it has not concluded. So the issues that the committee has raised and that have been discussed this morning um, around reclassification are ones that need to be, that need continued consideration and that will happen. But I would also emphasise that what we are proposing, uh, or what is proposed as, as part of the stage one review, is that the uh, separate <coughs> bodies continue to, 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 to exist. Um, so I think our assessment thus far is that there's nothing on the head of a pin. No, I think well, I think my our, our assessment thus far is that um, that that we do not see that uh, ONS reclassification is uh, is in any way likely from the proposals that we've put in place. But what I can say is that I, I recognise that is something that requires to be considered as the proposals are developed over the coming months. So you don't think it'll have any impact on how far you can push universities on widening access? You've you've done that work, and you don't think that's a risk. I think that's work that needs to continue. I think it's very important. So you're that saying that the, the proposal came out before that work was concluded and you were confident in that? No, I'm not. I, no, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that at the end of stage one of the Enterprise and Skills Review, an overarching uh, recommendation was set out in relation to the creation of a strategic body that would ensure overall alignment of our enterprise and skills systems. And the detailed implementation of that is something that is part of stage two. And I think the points that you are raising, the important points you are raising, are ones that will be fully considered as part of stage two. I cannot envisage that the um, overarching arrangement that we've set out um, would in any way compromise the status of the universities uh, or indeed uh, the ambitions that government has set out in relation to widening access. But I absolutely accept those are matters that must be considered carefully as the work continues. Well, let's hope you're right. I'm going to uh, suspend the committee. Thank you very much indeed for your evidence. Going to suspend until 10.40. Thank you.
We now move on to item three, which is our evidence session on the Audit Scotland report to the National Fraud Initiative in Scotland. I welcome to the meeting Russell Frith, Assistant Auditor General and Owen Smith, Senior Manager for Audit Scotland. And I invite Russell Frith to make brief opening comments before I open up to questions from members. Thank you, Convener, and thank you for the opportunity to brief the Committee on the National Fraud Initiative exercise, which is carried out every two years across the UK and helps public bodies to minimise fraud and error in their organisations. The NFI works by matching large volumes of data across the public sector to identify matches for further consideration by the participating bodies. The data sets we include uh, include payrolls, pension information, creditor information, housing benefit data, information on deceased persons and failed asylum seekers. Audit Scotland's payroll is included in the exercise and payroll data generally includes both staff and elected representatives at all levels. It's important to note that matches themselves do not necessarily mean that fraud or error has taken place there is limited information within the data sets and it's always essential that the participating bodies take the matches and investigate them properly to ensure that fraud or error does or does not exist in each case. The NFI was started by the Audit Commission in 1996 using implied auditor powers. The uh, devolved nation's audit agencies joined in the early 2000s and the power to conduct the exercises was put on a statutory footing in Scotland through the Criminal Justice and Licensing Act 2010. The NFI is a tool, it's a tool to help public bodies as part of their overall arrangements to prevent and detect fraud and error. It's not the only part of those arrangements. Audit Scotland's role is to facilitate the exercise using its statutory powers to obtain data and we prepare reports on the, the outcomes of each exercise. In the 1415 exercise, 104 Scottish bodies took part and £16.8 million of outcomes were identified. That takes the total identified in Scotland to £110 million out of about £1.3 billion across the UK. Um, the values is one part of the uh, impact of the exercise, but there are others. Um, the deterrent effect is quite important of people knowing that this sort of data matching exercise takes place. And some outcomes are not so easily measurable in monetary terms. So, for example, in relation to blue badges, making sure that only valid blue badges helps to keep the uh, relevant parking spaces available for those who really need them and are entitled to them. Even where there are no outcomes or very few outcomes identified for a body, it provides assurance on positive assurance on the uh, absence of fraud and error in those particular areas for, that, for that, that body. Looking forward, we've now commenced NFI's 2016-17, um, small increase in the number of bodies taking part, including now the larger further education colleges in Scotland. Um, the Cabinet Office took over responsibility for the NFI in England following the abolition of the Audit Commission and it's looking to extend the range of tools available to participating bodies, including flexible matching, which allows bodies to request more frequent matching, um, at times convenient for them, and something called an, an app checker, which is a, f a fraud prevention service allowing bodies to check against the NFI databases before payments are made, rather than the retrospective once every two year uh, full NFI exercise. Um, in Scotland, we're also keeping an eye on the uh, development of the new tax and social security powers to ensure that uh, those data sets will in future be available to be included with NFI to help ensure that uh, the devolved benefits um, reach the right people. And in summary, we believe that the NFI continues to be a useful tool to help public bodies minimise fraud and error and we're happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you very much, Mr Frith. Colin Beattie is going to open questioning. Thank you, Vera. Um, I'd like to start by looking at, uh, obviously, the outcomes. And you're estimating here that the last initiative, there's £16.8 million of savings, actual and notional. In paragraph 81, you estimate that the cash savings for the public purse 
are about half the total outcomes. And you rightly raised the fact about blue badges. Uh, there is a notional benefit from that. There's also a cost to the council because fraudulent or not, people were paying for these. So there's a slight loss of revenue there as well. But the bigger picture is looking at the overall effort. Are the, are the outcomes commensurate with the effort that goes in? And I'm not decrying the, <clears throat> the uh, deterrent effect, but are they commensurate? I, be I believe they, they are commensurate. Um, one of the things we do to help minimise that effort is we provide a number of software tools to the participating bodies so that they can refine the matches that they receive to identify those that are most likely to give rise to an impact. And what we expect them to do is to look at those higher risk matches first and if those are not demonstrating much value, then we don't expect them to continue through all the lower risk matches. But looking at uh, the figures you've given us, you say there's 2,522 investigations underway to recover 4.2 million. Doesn't that seem a lot of expensive investigations for a relatively small return? Some of those investigations will be very, very short. Um, so, council tax, then that's if you, you find somebody that's been living with somebody else and they've already claimed the single person discount, all you've got to do is cancel that and then rebuild, you can change the council tax bill and recover the money very simply. So, that's a very simple match and a very simple outcome or return to the council. That's real revenue back in at the council that wouldn't take too much time to do. So, I, I think that was very much worth doing in the last exercise. This exercise, that was our biggest. Um, outcome area was single person discount, um, f not fraud, but um, error or undisclosed living together, basically. Now, I agree there's a deterrent effect in this, but I don't believe that, that the NFI is particularly well known to the public. Uh, the deterrent effect really is on the people who are immediately caught out and perhaps their immediate uh, circle. So how big a deterrent is it actually? That's always a very difficult thing to measure, something that you can't, you, you can't see. But I, I would point out that some of the areas that were um, of high, high value in the very early exercises, the value of uh, fraud and error coming out of those areas has declined over the, uh, the life of, of NFI, um, including housing benefit, including, I think, things related to payrolls as well, in the, in, and certainly those in relation to pensions being paid uh, after people had died, that has definitely fallen away. You've highlighted some issues around the quality of the effort that's been put into this, and on paragraph 94, you state that central government bodies have overall significantly improved, but NHS and local government has not. That's is, is, is there a significant reason for... Ex you've mentioned one or two reasons for the, for the uh, local government, but you haven't for NHS. Yes, that's right. For, for local government, the timing of this exercise and the transfer of many of their existing fraud staff to the DWP's um, National um, Fraud and Error Service uh, probably didn't help uh, prioritise in investigations. With the NHS, I would say it's still a very good level of, uh, of, of participation, but a bit lower than the, in the previous exercise. The NHS, it's uh, an area where it is more difficult to obtain the buy-in because the outcomes for the NHS bodies themselves tend to be very much lower than for local government bodies, simply because of the nature of the NHS activity and the data sets that, that, that are being used. The importance of keeping the NHS data in there relates as much to where it helps other bodies to establish a match and either fraud or error taking place. I mean, clearly with local government, there, there is a problem, uh, which you've highlighted, by you've, you've mentioned a number of the 
uh, councils that have been a problem. But you've also mentioned the Scottish Police Authority, which is a bit of a surprise. I think the uh, like, most likely explanation there is the still developing um, systems, certainly at the point when this data was being collected, um, which is back in October 2014. At that point, the police authority was still very much developing its systems uh, and... Well, I hope that it's going to be a bit better this time round, eh? Certainly hope so, yes. Okay. Um, looking at the quality of what's been produced, you're talking about late submissions and all sorts of issues around that. Is it not made clear to the participants what the deadlines are? Yes, it is. And they, there's no penalty, of course, is there? There, there, there is no penalty. Um, and in most cases, we do get the data, uh, albeit uh, a, a bit later, um, which, if that data is taken at a later point, it's still very useful, but it means that the investigations, subsequent investigations, are slightly more complicated because you've got data coming from different bodies at different times. So the ideal for us is that all the data comes in as at the same date. Coming back to the NHS, you, say, you state here in paragraph uh, 96 that uh, NHS bodies' arrangements for NFI have weakened. I mean, you're still saying it's good, but the fact it's weakened is worrying. Where are you taking that? We will be uh, monitoring all bodies' uh, participation in the exercise, not only the provision of data in the first place, but we are able to look at when bodies access the matches that are provided, when they look at them, when they investigate them, when they mark them up, and we then work with the local auditors of each of those bodies to keep the pressure on to make sure that they are actively participating. So, so you take it to the local auditor? That's, yes. That's your escalation point? Yes. But wouldn't you think that uh, if this is weakened, it's a, it's a significant issue and it, it should be escalated perhaps to the Scottish Government? Uh, weakened from a, a high position to satisfactory in most cases for NHS. And, and what, what this report is is a, is a two-year exercise and every year we annually encourage and, and assist our local auditors to review the arrangements in each body. And every year they'll produce an annual audit report um, that goes to the those charge of governance and the Auditor General and the Council Commission to discuss areas of governance, including how well they engaged and participated in the National Fund Initiative. So we do see success at local level and sometimes this sort of exercise is much as about getting a, a, you know, a, a momentum up to get bodies to engage properly and that's how we produce some sort of self-help guides and areas that they can improve going forward and the best area for me would be the audit, audit committees to take far more um, involvement in looking at how the NFI exercises are actually progressing in terms of delivering the, the materials, the data sets on time, having a resource plan, how they're going to investigate them and uh, what the results are so they're fully engaged and cited of what has been found locally. Um, that for us has been the best way to engage and we also have had other successes and there's two councils, Perth and Canross and Angus, disagreed with the interpretation of legislation on giving us the electoral registration. We accepted that, but we asked what they did instead to use single-person discount information to prevent and encourage more income into the council, and they now are doing that and using the data, so that's a win for us, but it, it doesn't come through the National Fraud Initiative, but it's still a way we can encourage. We did that through the local auditor as well, so we do work closely with auditors and the bodies to encourage them to, to make use of data and the NFI exercise to deliver the best for for their, 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 their taxpayers and public. Can bodies opt out of this, choose not to participate? We have the statutory power to demand the data to take place from the bodies that are within the remit of the Auditor General or the Accounts Commission. What's the penalty if they don't? There isn't one. There isn't one? Not in the legislation, no. So, it is things like naming in this report, um, local auditors including it in their annual audit reports, which are also public documents and considered by those charged with governance in the organisation. So it's, it's sort of 
peer pressure, publicity, that other main um, tools that we have available. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. James Kelly. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, I'm just interested in this uh, outcome figure of £16.8 million pounds that's been recorded. Is that £16.8 million pounds that's either fraudulently or erroneously um, been taken out of the system? It is, it is the estimated value of the outcomes from the exercise in a way that tries to put all of the outcomes into a the same currency, in this case, pounds, um, because uh, some of it will be uh, value that has been taken out of the system, so uh, a single person discount that's been claimed uh, for the last few years is clearly uh, a value that's been taken out of the system. But, for example, pensions being paid to people who are deceased, um, the value in this that's recorded in this exercise is the value not only of any pension that's already been lost, but an estimate of the future value that would have been lost had the match not occurred. Right. So just just to understand that why is that an estimate and not why why can't we be more be more certain about these instances that you've quoted? Because we're looking because in some cases we're looking forward. So for example, estimating how long a pension would have been claimed had it not been picked up through the exercise is it is very much an estimate. Um, we, we use the remaining expected average life of, of, a, of a pensioner for that particular purpose. Um, in the case of council tax discounts, uh, it's two years' worth um, that, that's used uh, on a consistent basis across all the um, agencies that, that undertake this work. Uh, and does the data go down to individual transaction level, or, or, or is there an element of extrapolation involved? It's all down at an individual transaction level. Okay, so in terms of the 16.8 million that's been identified as an outcome of uh, items that are either, have either been fraudulently or erroneously taken out of the system, how much of that value has actually been returned into the public purse? It's recovered, well, it's been recovered just now, but it's about just under £5 million has been recovered. So that's the value of cash. But what you can't recover is what you never paid out because you prevented it from being paid out in the first place by stopping the ongoing pension or um, single-person discount. So it's £5 million that's been recovered just now. Right, yeah. So there's a, by, by taking action to stop an ongoing fraud, for example, then you, you, you're stopping a, an ongoing exercise, but... You've identified 16.8 million of transactions, of which 5 million, around 5 million, have been recovered. Right, OK. Liz Smith. Thank you, Convener. Just a, a very small point. Um, in relation to paragraph 70, um, you, you make the point about uh, SAS has generally what I think is probably quite a good uh, record in terms of uncovering any student support that has being claimed er erroneously. Am I right that that is a very low figure and therefore there's no major concerns about um, fraudulent claims Sorry. for...? Um, they're on this, for want of a better expression, and they work um, very well trying to reduce this type of fraud, but the NFI has proved an effective way to double-check. But if people have got fraudulent passports, it's very hard to... You know, they have to rely on the Home Office as a, a second check, the, the data there. So, so yes, it's... The, this has come down from memory. I've not, not just checked yeah, that. Uh, yes. so it's, that um, was my next question. I was going to ask you, is this an improved figure? Yes. Okay. In terms of there's less found. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> We're no, not trying to get more. Yeah, yeah, I understand <laughs> what you mean. Thank you. Um, correct me if I've misunderstood this, but just for, for clarification, I mean, this committee's job is to follow the public pound, and I know you've asked, is it 104 uh, public bodies to participate in this. How do um, arm's length organisations and uh, contractors uh, play into this? Is there any investigation of fraud within, within those? We do not have the power to demand the data from bodies outside of the uh, Auditor General and Accounts Commission's remits. But we do have the power to accept voluntarily 
uh, participation by other bodies. And for the exercise that's just started, we are getting data voluntarily from some of the alios linked to councils, for example. Okay. Um, as I said uh, earlier, the NFI is only one part of a public body's uh, fraud and error prevention. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, paragraph 11 on page 9 says that 104 bodies participated. Um, it says two further education colleges were invited but didn't submit any data. Can you tell me which FE colleges those were, please? Um, City of Glasgow and Edinburgh. Edinburgh College. Okay, did they give reasons for not doing, doing so? No. No reasons at all? Okay. Well, I've been through this for... This is often an organic process to try and encourage folk to see the benefits of um, using data matching and also indicate we've, we've now got 10 colleges taking part or invited to take part, um, six of whom have already got their data in. I still don't have Edinburgh or Glasgow. We'll check again with them. But we don't have any power to actually... You know, we can mandate it. That's what the law um, lets us do, but... We would never, I don't think we'd ever go to court over it. <laughs> if you see me, it wouldn't be a very good use of public money. So we will ask them again why they haven't done it. But this exercise is complete. The, this is. We'll start with, we, we do this every two years. So we, yes. we've started another exercise. It's the, the date for submission of data was um, two days ago. For the next, this will be another report coming you know, in 2018. And have Edinburgh College submitted to that? N well, not when I checked on Tuesday. Okay, so they didn't submit this last one and they haven't submitted for the forthcoming one? So far. Okay. And you said, um, Mr well, Smith, you just said in your answer there as well that you do have the power to demand the information. Have you done so? We wrote to them and effectively ma we mandate the data um, from these bodies. But the, the, as was already raised, how, what do we do if we don't get it? That's, that's the... There is no penalty. I, don't, I personally wouldn't want that either because it's a... It's a thing that's trying to add benefit, and it should be seen as that um, to the public sector. Um, it's not. So there's no penalty, but you said you have the power legally under the Act to, to, to demand to, the information. Yes. So what's, what, what would, what, what, hypothetically, if you were to take the next step, what would it be? What? As, as Owen said, the a date for submitting data has only just passed. We will now be looking at any organisation that has not... Uh, submitted data and be following up directly with each one of them as to is there a reason why not is it going to be coming in the near future uh, and we'll consider what level of escalation we can uh, apply okay. uh, depending on their answers okay but to go back to this report you wrote to them and asked them for it and it wasn't taken any further then yes okay um were there any other invited organisations who didn't participate, the, the 104 bodies participated, were there, and two further education colleges were invited but didn't submit any data, were there any other bodies that were invited? How many bodies did you invite altogether? 104 participated. What was the invitation number? 100, I can't remember. It gets very complicated with Scottish Government because it, it covers so many I'm different... Sure. different Bodies, payrolls, and credit systems. So, okay. so we had it was over a hundred and. But as far as I'm aware, yeah, we got we got, we got, the got data everything, from everything every other organisation that we the two colleges. Okay. So it was just the two just the two colleges out of the whole public sector yes. in Scotland but, that didn't but, but, submit but, data. Yes. Interesting. Okay. Um, they have submitted it in previous ones, like four years ago. City of Glasgow took part. So. Do you think there's something to be said for making this initiative compulsory? Well, I, I sit on the Scottish Government's Counter Fraud Forum with many other bodies, such as SAS, the Scottish Public Pensions Agency, Police Scotland, COSLA, etc. And you know, there is a the Scottish Government's real, um, last year issued a, a new sort of counter fraud strategy, and within that, we're all trying to work together to to push this. And where we see it is the NFI is a, a very useful tool, but it's not the only tool in terms of data matching. So we're, what we want to see is bodies using their data and the Information Commissioner wants to see them using their data to, um, legally to, to make sure that they are doing all they can do to prevent fraud and error in the system. Um, so 
for me, it's a governance issue as well. It, it's really up to those charge of governance to make sure they're they're, they're taking care of this. And audit has been filling a gap. Those in charge of governance at the individual in, say, institutions. A, a council, an education college, a, a central government body would be where I would be asking the questions if they're not either taking part in the NFI or doing an alternative one. We have examples in the support of councils doing alternative data matching for council tax very successfully. That's good. So the fact it's not NFI, we're not going to get too upset about it as long as they're doing something. Um, so I don't know what we'd get from um, making it compulsory. Um, you might get data from Edinburgh and Glasgow colleges. Get data. We'd have to make them look at it, though. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a good point. But they'd have to then investigate it. We don't do the investigations. That's the body themselves. So. Um, okay. Um, you've been able to quantify the sums recovered through the National Fraud Initiative. Is it possible for Audit Scotland to quantify the money that they have saved the taxpayer through other work? Or is that a question and for the Auditor General herself? I, I, I think that is a question for the, for the, for the, for the Auditor General. Um, but in, 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 in principle, es estimating the impact of our work is something that we... Uh, is, is a continuing uh, area for us to look at. Um, but we do have to bear in mind that the impact of a lot of our work isn't necessarily wholly financial. Mm -hmm. Can you offset the cost of this work against the save against the money recovered? Yes. No. Um, the the cost of the the cost of the initial exercise is met from Audit Scotland's funding provided by the Parliament. Uh -huh. um, for the individual bodies, the cost of their investigation exercises, yes, is is offset against anything that they they recover. Okay, so it's a, it's a split cost in a way. Um, I mean, this is governed by the Criminal Justice and Licensing Act 2010. Your initiative, it's fraud by sorry, it's underpinned by that legislation, isn't it? And to go back to the point we were making about somebody's participation. Do you think this suggests a fault with with the act? I, I, I'm usually in two minds as to whether um, there should be penalties or sanctions within each piece of legislation. For something like this, I think it is preferable if we are able to persuade organisations to participate uh, willingly because that will also improve the quality of the investigations that they they carry out, um, which is likely to lead to an overall um, better overall impact than if they feel they are being sort of dragged to do um, the, the minimum that they can. Thank you. Do members have further questions? Can I thank you both very much indeed for your evidence this morning. I now move the committee into private session as previously agreed.